Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor asserts that it's evidence she was compelled to leave. He suggests that a resignation could indicate the administration's preparedness to gradually distance itself from the Ukrainian crisis over the coming months, albeit discreetly. He describes Victoria Nuland as the embodiment of unfavorable traits in U.S. policy toward Ukraine and Russia. He emphasizes that while her departure doesn't fundamentally alter Washington's stance, it does signify a resolve to eventually withdraw. Russia Drawing a parallel, he likens the prospective disengagement to past instances such as the Vietnam War and the recent Afghanistan withdrawal, highlighting how attention dwindled post-exit. He suggests that the media and the public will likely comply with a shift away from discussing Ukraine, mirroring the trajectory seen with Afghanistan. He suggests that this aligns with the historical pattern of Democratic presidents, referencing notable quotes from past administrations regarding avoiding sending American troops into foreign conflicts. He dismisses the relevance of the current president's statements to the ongoing operation, emphasizing that the outcome won't resemble the rhetoric. He finds Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson's consistent nodding during the president's speech intriguing, particularly regarding remarks about Putin, which he deems absurd. He asserts the inevitability of a U.S. withdrawal from the situation, citing a lack of military capability to challenge Russia in eastern Ukraine. He concludes that the only viable option is a quiet withdrawal, hoping to avoid widespread attention due to the embarrassment it would entail. He believes it likely indicates the absence of organized American combat troops currently stationed in Ukraine. He acknowledges the presence of U.S. military personnel, particularly from the Army, engaged in various support roles such as advising, training, and technical assistance. He disputes the notion that Ukrainians can operate advanced equipment without assistance from America and British and other NATO officers and soldiers. He acknowledges the accuracy of the statement regarding the absence of combat formations being sent to Ukraine, highlighting logistical and organizational limitations. He asserts that contrary to European expectations, neither the U.S. nor Europe possesses the capability or readiness to confront Russia effectively. He suggests that Western European elites are in a state of panic, realizing the limits of their alignment with the U.S. in the face of escalating tensions. He interprets the situation as of a search for an exit strategy from the predicament the U.S. created in Ukraine. He asserts the futility of Ukraine's NATO membership aspirations and the likelihood of anyone engaging in war with Russia over it. He cites a friend in the French army who humorously remarks that their readiness extends only to Sepphoris in northern Africa, a sentiment he agrees with regarding the general state of European armies as boutique forces ill-equipped for serious conflict. He finds the leaked German conversation tragic, revealing a decline in military professionalism and a lapse in security protocols. He critiques the discussion as amateurish and reminiscent of high school discourse. He highlights a lack of understanding of the seriousness of the situation surrounding the potential transfer of Taurus missiles to Ukraine. He raises concerns about the consequences if these missiles operated by us, German, British, or other Allied personnel, were used against Russia, risking a significant escalation of conflict. He questions the decision-making process, emphasizing the potential for such weapons to be turned against the nations providing them. He notes Putin's warnings about such actions and suggests that if carried out, Berlin and other cities could face similar threats. He acknowledges the destruction of most of the missiles and expresses concern about efforts to repurpose Patriot missiles into surface-to-surface -surface missiles, a departure from their original purpose of countering aerial threats. He notes the increased danger posed by this development. He anticipates that the Russians will detect and neutralize such missiles. He emphasizes that the Russians are reaching a point where they are declaring enough is enough, warning against continued threats and attacks on their territory and people. He stresses the significance of this boundary as a dangerous red line not to be crossed. He describes them as smart bombs due to modifications enabling precise targeting. These bombs are deployed from aircraft flying towards selected targets, launching them on a trajectory equipped with fins and precision guidance systems. These glide bombs, capable of carrying significant payloads, have been utilized against Ukrainians, causing devastating effects akin to those witnessed in previous conflicts like Gaza.
he highlights the limitations of fixed fortifications in the face of such weaponry as they can be precisely targeted and obliterated, rendering defense efforts futile. He affirms that the U.S. possesses precision-guided systems, though perhaps not in the same quantity as the Russians. He notes that while smaller where systems like the small diameter bomb are typically utilized, the capability is present. He emphasizes that the Russians also possess comparable inventories signaling the end of the era where the U.S. held a monopoly on precision strike capabilities. He dismisses the notion of the evidence suggesting a U.S. monopoly on such capabilities, though acknowledges the Russian respect for American military prowess in this regard. He expresses concerns about potential nuclear escalation, referencing statements from both sides regarding the conditions under which nuclear weapons might be used. He fears a scenario where the U.S. could be compelled into an undignified withdrawal and may resort to nuclear threats, hoping such a situation can be avoided. He suggests that while the U.S., the government keeps such information hidden from its citizens. The Russians have been aware of it all along, including details about biolabs conducting sinister-sinister experiments aimed at developing bio -we weapons targeting Slavic people in Eastern Europe. He finds this incomprehensible and frightening. He believes the Russians already know, so there's little point in continuing to conceal it. Regarding disengagement, he asserts that the U.S. plans to quietly withdraw without making formal announcements, which has created fear among Europeans. He predicts a backlash from their electorates for aligning too closely with the U.S. and anticipates a rise in right-wing nationalist sentiments. He recalls a time when European leaders like Helmut Schmidt expressed discomfort with U.S. Actions labeling them as cowboys and contrast it with the current perception of U.S. Instability He concludes that the current state of affairs resembles amateur hour and suggests that this realization is widespread. He remarks that a fundamental assumption guiding Israeli operations is unconditional U.S. Support, which remains unchallenged. He acknowledges the prevailing influence Netanyahu holds over decision-making in Washington, surpassing even that of President Biden. He notes Biden's commitment to supporting Israeli requests despite personal reservations, cited it as evidence of Netanyahu's inaccurate assessment of the situation. He asserts that such support for Israel will not waver, regardless of circumstances. He reflects on American attitudes towards the Middle East, noting a general lack of interest among the populace with those who do engage often harboring negative perceptions of Arabs and Muslims. He laments the hostile environment cultivated in the region over decades of U.S. involvement. He acknowledges the limited impact of dissenting voices outside of those in power in Washington, emphasizing the prevailing of being voiceless, if not in positions of influence. He shifts focus to the region's inhabitants, speculating on potential shifts in viewpoints post-Ramadan, suggesting the emergence of a coalition willing to take action, albeit after the conclusion of Ramadan. He anticipates a significant shift in the region, moving away from dealing solely with non-state actors. He predicts escalating actions by Mr. Netanyahu, particularly targeting Rafa, as he sees it as necessary for population eradication. Additionally, he foresees potential confrontations with Hezbollah, understanding their formidable nature compared to Hamas. He expects these developments to prompt changes among Arab states in the peninsula, Turkey, and Iran, which may feel compelled to act in alignment against Israeli actions. He highlights potential unrest in Egypt and Jordan and ponders the U.S. Dot's response, considering its long-standing support for Israel and the growing assertiveness towards Iran and Turkey. He concludes that the prospect of a wider regional conflict is tangible. He asserts that President Biden is firmly under Mr. Netanyahu's influence and unlikely to take action against Israel. While acknowledging the importance of Israel's defense, he criticizes the current tactics as far from defensive, citing the use of smart bombs and potential attacks on Hezbollah as offensive measures. He expresses disdain for Biden's approach, referring to the routine of bombing, followed by offering aid as a recurring pattern in U.S.